I am so thrilled to bring on our first keynote speaker to the stage, Ulku Ro. Ulku Ro is the Technical Director of Financial Services in the Office of the CTO at Google Cloud. Before joining Google, Ulku was a Managing Director at JP Morgan, where she was the Global Head and CTO of Credit Risk Technology. Prior to that, Ulku was a Managing Director at Bank of America Merrill Lynch, where she was the Global Head of Market Risk Technology. Earlier in her career, she had a variety of technical uh, technology leadership positions at UBS Building Trading and Analytics System. Throughout her career, she helped drive business transformation through technical innovation and leadership. Her focus has been building highly scalable enterprise systems, leveraging grid computing, quantitative analytics, and big data technology. Basically, if you miss all that, she is a badass. <laughs> Olga received her BS degree in computer engineering from Bosphorus University in Istanbul and her MS degree in computer science from University of Illinois at Urbana Campaign. Hey, yes, you, you made some noise today. Thank you. Do that, y'all. That was great. She serves on the board of director at the Fulbright Association. Please, please join me in welcoming Olga Rowe. Hi, everyone. Hi. <laughs> All right. It's 1987. I just started high school. In the US, Congress has declared March the National Women's History Month. Aretha Franklin became the first woman inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. 20 years after, she recorded Respect. <laughs> Respect was recorded right here in New York City at the Atlantic Studios. 1987 was the same year that Simpsons debuted. <laughs> Lisa was my favorite, the smart, intellectual eight-year-old, always challenging the norms she doesn't believe in, always looking into the future. And there she is with her telescope. It was the same year that Reagan delivered his famous speech at the Berlin Wall. I'm in my living room in Istanbul, the 30-inch TV at the corner. We're all huddled around, tuned to every word. It was a speech that changed the world. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. I was filled with optimism that we could, indeed, change the world. That was me. <laughs> uh, just like Lisa Simpson with my telescope, I was a quiet, nerdy kid who loves math and science, you know, way before we called it STEM. I was the super nerd, the president of the science branch, the president of the astronomy club and the ecology club. <laughs> the, the telescope that you saw, I had petitioned to school to buy it. And I actually got us permission to use the rooftop terrace of the school. It was off limits to every kid, but we could go there with our telescope and watch the stars and the planets. I'm at a private girls school in, in Istanbul, and it was a school that taught us we could do anything. We could change the world. The girls ran the student government, the basketball team, the school newspaper, the debate team, everything. It's 1995. I have just arrived at the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana, Champaign. <laughs> My first week there, I go to the computer lab. I, I walk in, you know, I open the door, I look inside, and it's a nerd factory. <laughs> it's rows and rows of the stereotypical nerds, boys in t-shirts and sweatshirts, pizza boxes stacked high up, and soda cans everywhere. And I look around, and I think to myself, where are all the girls? Where are all the girls? What I hadn't realized until then was 
I wasn't supposed to study computer science. That other girls didn't have the opportunity to play with math and science the way I did. I didn't realize that there were biases in society. I didn't realize that soon I was going to need Aretha's anthem, respect. I didn't realize that there were many, many walls for us women to take down long after the Berlin Wall came down. A couple weeks ago, I was at uh, Google's Women's Summit for Senior Leaders, and I got a chance to meet Megan Smith. Megan is amazing. So Megan is one of the original Googlers that started the Tech Makers program. And she gave the original keynote four years ago. And since then, she went on to become the chief, te chief technology officer for the United States under the Obama administration. And she was actually the very first female CTO of our country. There you go. Give it up for Megan. Megan said something very interesting. She said, there are 16 million programmers in the world, 16 million. And women are about 10 to 15% of it, so there's about 2 to 3 million of us. But where are we? Why can't we see ourselves? Why are we invisible? And that really stuck with me, because that was the thing that I was thinking about. You know, where are the girls? Technical women have always been in our industry. And in fact, they've been some of the founders. And it's one of the things that we need to know, and it's we need to, one of the things that we need to embrace. For example, Ada Lovelace. Ada was born in 1815. Her father was the very famous poet, Lord Byron. Her mother was an aristocrat. And they got separated when Ada was only a few weeks old. And her mother was so frustrated with Lord Byron's moody and unpredictable ways that she wanted Ada to be nothing like him. So, to combat any dangerous poetic tendencies that she may have in her DNA, she had him, her tutored in math and science exclusively. And Ada loved math and science. When she was 17 years old, she met Charles Babbage. Charles Babbage is the father of the computer. He invented the machine called the analytical engine, which was basically a, an early mechanical computer. Now, Ada was fascinated by this machine. We would not have known about Ada's work if it wasn't for a paper that she was asked to translate. See, at the time, women didn't write technical papers. So Ada not only translated this paper, but she added her own notes to it. And her notes were three times as long as the original paper. <laughs> and in her notes, she talked about how that computers could be used to work on anything that could be noted logically, not just numbers, but pictures and sounds and video. So she understood about instruction sets that you could upload into the computers. And she even gave step-by-step -step instructions on how you could get the machine to compute the Bernoulli number sequence. So in essence, she had just developed the world's first theoretical software algorithm. So if Babbage was the father of the computer, Ada is the mother of software. There you go. So much of the modern computer engineering has its roots in World War II. At the time, the word computer was a job title. It wasn't a machine. And these computers, they wore skirts. Computers were more than 10,000 women code breakers and women who calculated ballistic missile trajectories during World War II at the US Army and Navy. And they were picked out from um, countries, colleges from all over the world. At the time, men were needed for the fighting. And they weren't even interested in this kind of work. It was the battlefield where the heroes were born. 
the mathematical, the cerebral work, that was women's work. <laughs> so these women were behind some of the most significant code-breaking efforts during the war. The information they provided allowed the Allied forces to monitor ship locations and destroy them. And they allowed, it, they allowed them to uh, monitor government communications. These women were worked in crowded offices in the heat of the summer. Everyone was sweating so much that their dresses were um, wet from the top to bottom. And, um, and, and it was also emotionally draining work. They realized that if they made a mistake, Someone may die. So these women were trailblazers, but we never heard about their work. Why? Why did we never hear about the work? Well, these women were sworn to secrecy. They were sworn to secrecy, and they took that very seriously. It was drilled in them that loose lips sink ships. Loose lips sink ships. Over time, many of the men's stories were leaked out, but not the women's. Even their most loved ones, their husbands and their daughters and their sons had no idea what a phenomenal contribution their mothers have done. America wasn't the only country tapping into uh, its women during World War II. Bletchley Park was Britain's code-breaking headquarters. Now, many of us know about Alan Turing, and we know about the bomb machine that was used to crack the Enigma codes. What a lot of us don't know is about the 12,000 women that worked at Bletchley Park, most of them young female code-breakers. The leaders of the Bletchley Park um, looked for women who were linguists, mathematicians, chess champions, and even crossword puzzle um, experts. In 1942, the Daily Telegraph hosted a competition where a crossword was to be solved within 12 minutes. Winners were approached by the military and hired. The code-breaking work at Bletchley is but estimated to have shortened the war by two years and saved thousands and thousands of lives. ENIAC, the world's first digital general purpose computer built in 1945. 1945. In 1980, a young computer programmer, her name was Kathy Kleiman, came across some old pictures of the ENIAC, like these ones up here. And she noticed some of these pictures had women in them. So she inquired about them. She inquired at the Computer Science Museum. And, and one of the representatives told her that um, the women were refrigerator ladies. They were just women there to make the product look good. They were models. They were not the models. They were the original team that programmed the ENIAC. They were Francis and Jean and Marlon and Kay and Francis and Ruth. Their story had been forgotten for 40 years. See, at the time, the historians covered um, the, the computing as a story of hardware, whereas the women were doing all the programming. These women had none of the programming tools of today. They were pretty much given the blueprints of the ENIAC and the wiring diagrams, and they were told to go figure it out. And they did figure it out. They programmed the original ENIAC, and, and they also went in to train the next generation of computer programmers. We can. <laughs> yes, we can. <laughs> Grace Hopper, Navy Admiral. She was born right here in New York City. Pioneer of computer programming, invented one of the first compiler-related tools. She popularized the idea of machine-independent programming, led the development of COBOL, still in use today. <laughs> Hedy Lamar, she's one of my favorite. She was called the most beautiful woman at the time, and she's gorgeous. 
But in the 1940s, she quietly invented what would become the precursor to many of the wireless technologies we use today, things like GPS and cell phone networks and Bluetooth. She understood that there was a problem with radio signals that they could easily be jammed. So she invented this concept of frequency hopping so that you don't broadcast on the single channel, but you ch keep changing the frequency. So if, if you get jammed on one, you're only there for a second. And the vestiges of her, of her work is still used today. But still, today, we call her the most beautiful woman. She's also an inventor. She's also a scientist. She's also a tech pioneer. Rosalind Franklin. When we say DNA or double helix, most of us think of James Watson and Francis Crick. We don't really hear about Rosalind. The iconic photograph 51 right there is the X-ray diffraction image of the DNA taken by Rosalind Franklin and her PhD student Raymond Gosling. It was critical evidence in identifying the structure of the DNA. You can see it right there, the double helix. James Watson and Francis Crick went on to receive the Nobel Prize four years after she died of ovarian cancer at the age of 37, probably because of the work that she was doing with x-rays. Rosalind wasn't even mentioned. Hidden figures, who watched the movie? All right. Who here? can tell me the name of the three women that were in the movie. <laughs> Katherine Johnson, Mary Jackson, Dorothy Vaughn. <laughs> well done. So most of us have watched the movie. Only a few of us can name the names. Let's start talking about Catherine and Dorothy and Mary. That's what it means to claim our history. Let's all go home today and tell our daughters and sons and husbands and nieces about these women. We need to know our history. The world needs to know that. It's March 3rd, 2018. 30 years ago, I thought women could change the world. And today, women everywhere are changing the world every day. It just took a while. Powerful movements like Women's March, like Me Too, Time's Up, Never Again, are initiating meaningful change. Those kids in Florida are doing amazing work. And today's technologies, like the internet and mobile and social, are enabling that change. And women have been involved in both creating that technology and using that technology. And, um, and, and the future will be defined by the technology we're creating today. Most of it by machine learning and AI. Today, we see AI in image recognition and voice recognition and autonomous vehicles. But in the future, AI is going to be a part of every, every part of society, like healthcare and criminal justice and housing and employment. Now, fundamentally, AI is about training algorithms using vast amounts of data. The problem is the data that we have today carries the biases of our history. Conscious or unconscious, the data that we have today is biased. Think about healthcare. Today, if you are a woman, studies have shown that you're less likely to treat intensive treatment for a heart attack. If you are a woman over 50 who's critically ill, you're less likely to receive life-saving interventions. If you have knee pain, you're less likely to be referred for a knee replacement than a man. If you have heart failure, your access to EKGs may take longer. In finance, women don't have the same access to capital as men. 
Women own about 30% of the businesses, the small businesses in the US, but for every dollar of loan that women get, $23 go to men. Women on average have higher mortgage rates. In the world, 1.3 billion women is not even in the financial system at all. Now imagine all this data being used to train the AI algorithms that are going to make the healthcare decisions and finance decisions of tomorrow. Imagine all this bias being amplified. So today, as women technologists, we're sitting at a critical moment in history. We can define the future that we want, or we risk having the biases of our past being amplified in the future. So we have a responsibility. We have a call to ensure that AI models of the future and the data sets that they're being trained on do not carry forward the biases of our history. This is one of my favorite quotes. The most dangerous phrase in the language is, we've always done it this way. Here are some things that you could do differently after today. Small things that you could do today that can make big differences tomorrow. We've all been there. You're sitting in a meeting. Your comments keep getting lost. You kind of feel invisible. So I read this, um, this technique that the women of the White House came up with. They, they call it amplification. If one woman offers an idea and it's not being acknowledged, another woman would repeat it and give the credit to her colleague. Be that woman. <laughs> let's make sure we're visible. And let's make sure we make each other visible. Too often, we go to meetings, and there's, we're only either the only woman invited or only one of a few. If you are going to a meeting and you see that there's not enough women in the room, bring another woman along. Bring them. For too long, we've been isolated. Let's create opportunities to connect and support each other. Today, try to meet at least a couple of women that you haven't met before and talk about what you're going to do differently starting today. And finally, let's embrace our history. Let's embrace Aretha Franklin, embrace Lisa Simpson, Ada Lovelace, Frances Spence, Jean Bardick, Marlon Meltzer, Kay Antonelli, Betty Holberton, Ruth Teitelbaum, Hedy Lamar, Rosalind Franklin, Katherine Johnson, Dorothy Vaughn, Mary Jackson, and Grace Hopper. <laughs> we have inherited our past, but we can define our future. Thank you.